Good evening and uh, welcome to the American Writers Museum. I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Kerry Cranston. I'm the president of the American Writers Museum. Um, I want to thank folks for coming to this program. Um, we really appreciate you uh, visiting us on this evening. Uh, just a few short housekeeping things uh, before we begin the program. Uh, first off, if you like the kinds of programs you've seen from the American Writers Museum, you can join the museum as a member and get advanced notice and special access to upcoming events and programs. Um, if you want to visit our past programs and check out our YouTube page and click subscribe to get notified every time we add new content. So programs like this, a number of programs, we've been open almost five years now. Um, so there are hundreds of videos online of both past and recent programs, um, and many of them in curated lists. So please visit our YouTube page. Um, we also hope you will visit us in person in Chicago at our museum and at the Chicago Cultural Center on May 15th, 2022. Uh, we announced uh, earlier this week, we will be hosting the first ever American Writers Festival. Um, 70 writers over 30 more and more programs across the course of the day. Um, so this is going to be a wonderful programming event and it will be in celebration of our fifth anniversary. And so we're excited about the American Writers Festival and we hope you will join us for that. Um, our book selling partner for both on and offline programs is Seminary Co-op Bookstore. Once this event begins, we'll post a link to order today's book in the chat and we'll do so again before the end of the event. So if you're looking for a link to buy the book and we encourage you to do so, just take a quick look in the chat. Um, as you're watching tonight's program, if you have a question for our guest, um, please type it in the Q&A box. Um, you'll see Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, post the questions in there. When we get to the Q&A portion of the evening, we will try and answer as many of the questions as we can. Um, so please feel free to add them as the program progresses. And I'll remind people again when we get close to that point to put some questions in there. Um, so we apologize in advance if we don't get to everybody's, but we'll do what we can. Um, welcome especially to our Chicago Public School students and teachers and to all our students and educators who are attending. Um, thank you for all of your support of the past, present, and future of American writing. Today, the AWM launched its online exhibit, Polly Murray, Survival with Dignity, an exploration of the poet, lawyer, activist, and priest, and how her writing influenced Supreme Court decisions, the civil rights movement, and generations of individual writers, thinkers, artists, and change makers. So visit exhibits.americanwritersmuseum.org to see a number of our online interactive exhibits and especially to check out our new Polly Murray exhibit. Polly Murray is a friend to Eleanor Roosevelt, colleague to Ruth Bader Ginsburg and student of Thurgood Marshall. Polly Murray's life was nevertheless not always an easy one. Her commitment to fighting for the rights of women and all places her firmly in history. Um, so we are putting a chat um, in the link or a link in the chat for this new online exhibit. Um, but tonight we're going to be talking about Murray's life and night writing with uh, Deborah Nelson Link, author of the forthcoming children's book, um, Shouting for the Rights of All People. Deborah Link is the founder of the Hands On Black History Museum and a writer and educator. And I'd like to welcome Deborah Link. Thank you. Deborah, very nice to have you here. Thanks so much. Um, and uh, I'm excited to see your book. There's been a lot of talk of Pauli Murray in the last year or so. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and yet for many people, Pauli Murray is someone they have not known about or heard about um, and, and has not been as well represented for the uh, amount of uh, work they did in their lifetime um, and, and the impact that that work had. Um, I was wondering if you could kind of tell us about your first exposure to Pauli Murray's work. Was it as a reader, a scholar? How did you first encounter it? The, the first thing that I knew about Pauli Murray was I saw a quote um, by them on a poster during Black History Month. And here was this small person on this uh, poster and this really kind of nice quote. And I didn't know about her. And um, so I look up people that I don't know in Black history and so that I can learn and educate myself. This is a great quote. Why did this person use this and everything else? And so that was my very first exposure. How long ago was that? 
that's been several years now. And after that, it's like when you discover someone, then all of a sudden their name pops up everywhere. And it just started to pop up with, with different things. And I was like, I know this person. I know this person. I've heard of Polly Murray before. Yeah. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious. Uh, we should probably point out for people, too, an understanding mm -hmm. of uh, both you and I have switched pronouns a couple of times with Polly mm -hmm. Murray. Um, and, and we uh, have chosen to go that route, as was expressed by the Polly Murray Center, as the way that they've handled pronouns with relationship to Polly Murray. Do you kind of want to explain what that situation is? Okay, so in, in writing the book, um, my choice was to, as much as I could, stay true to Polly's voice and how they um, referred to themselves, which was she, her. And because of the time period in which she lived, there was only column A and column B. So there, there weren't other choices. And so, I have chosen to use both. And in the book, I've chosen to use both. So I use she, her, and sometimes I use they, them. And for people who are unfamiliar, this is because Pauli Murray um, had, um, was an LGBTQ um, and more than likely, um, you know, by her own writings and her diaries and other things, definitely saw herself at times as, uh, as male and as gender non-conforming and mm -hmm. so these were issues that may not have been she may not have been able to express properly as you said in her time mm -hmm. and uh, so it is definitely an issue and that's why um, in our exhibit and as you said in your book sometimes um, we move back and forth between the pronoun use mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so i'm curious you know you um, you, you learned about Polly Murray, you were excited about Polly Murray as a person, as a writer, um, as an activist. What made you decide to write a children's book? So I had, I had previously written a little children's book about Absalom Jones, kind of to share with an Absalom Jones celebration that we had here in the Diocese of Missouri. Mm -hmm. And I thought a lot of people said, oh, you should get that published. Oh, you should get that published. So I, I showed it to church publishing and they were in the midst of doing another Absalom Jones book at the time. And so they said, we like your writing. So if you write something else, let us know. Well, <clears throat> a couple of months after that, I was contacted by Church Publishing. And they said, would you be interested in writing a book about Polly Murray, having a conversation about that? And I was like, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And so I was like, now I can learn even more about Polly Murray. So, um, we had a conversation and nerd that I am got a big stack of books and read a bunch of stuff and kind of formulated an idea. And so that we could have this conversation and yay for church publishing saying that they wanted a black woman to tell this story. Mm -hmm. And um, so they said, let's, let's, let's see what you can do with her story. And, and in, it was appropriately made for, younger children or younger audience and that that kind of material um that i found online there was only one other children's book about Polly murray and um I, it's kind of off the top of my head thought on this issue is as you said you know church publishing wanted this to happen the um focus is for young kids um the American Library Association and, and other people have been very concerned of late about um, books being uh, banned or pushed out of curriculum because they deal with difficult issues. Obviously, Polly Murray's life is full of difficult issues related mm -hmm. to race, mm -hmm. discrimination, being LGBTQ. Um, have you, as yet, since the book is new, um, run into any issues or heard of any pushback that might occur? with this book? I have not, but of course in writing and kind of keeping an eye on the news, um, I think I've checked all the boxes for this being a banned book. And <laughs> I kind of proudly wear that, that banner of yes. And the reason that's an honor is because people are realizing and are rediscovering that words have power 
and books have power and can influence. And so, yes, we get to tell that story. And people forget that even though those books may be banned in schools, that as parents and teachers and grandparents, we can still have access to those books and share them with children. That we don't just have to wait for those books to be shared in the public schools or whatever the school setting is that um, you know, are, are in that process of dueling with parents who object to this. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm proudly wearing that banner. <laughs> Good. Um, so uh, Pauli Murray meant uh, a, so many things to so many people. Um, as a writer, how did you decide what to prioritize and include in the book? So this, it was an interesting process to go through, like I said, not having writ, written any book um, of this kind of length for, for children and, and thinking really well about my audience and thinking of what will appeal to my audience. And so um, what I did was after I had kind of researched all the things that I was gonna research, listening to um, oral histories, um, reading a book along with an audio tape of, of, of the book of her autobiography and all the other research, it looked like in my head, this winding path of her life. And so I started to map what that looked like. What happened first? What happened here? And I, I drew an actual path on long paper that had pages and pages. And I just started to mark things that I thought were pivotal things during her life or things that kids could connect with. And so I wrote those things down and then I went back in to fill in the blanks and kind of piece things together to give it some meat and, and, and see what I thought was important. And the thing that I did well afterwards, so I had written the book and then the, the documentary came out. Mm -hmm. And um, I watched the documentary with a pen and paper and I, I was like, yep, I talked about that, yep. <laughs> so it, it was kind of the same things that they saw as important too. And then it was important to me, I also decided that I wanted to listen, um, not just to what people had said about her, but to really honor and value Polly's voice. And so a lot of, of the things I kind of stuck to autobiography and oral histories, because this, this was her speaking to, to me and hopefully speaking to kids. Yeah. And um, I'm curious, you know, you, you, you talked a little bit in this research, but, you know, what sources did you focus on? You know, how did you find information on Polly's work? Um, I, you know, we've been working on this and it, it her work or their work is not as accessible in certain instances as we would expect from a major well-known author or activist. Mm -hmm. um, so how, how did you go about that and what was most pivotal for you? So um, I love the oral history that I was able to get online from archives. Mm -hmm. And so I forget a uh, four or five hour uh, oral history that I just took notes on and then listened to a second time. <laughs> <laughs> and wrote notes on again. And just that whole idea of hearing her voice, this yeah. is how I see the world. That was that was one of my biggest things. And then of course I I buy books. I mean, you know, like nobody's business. And so I I had copies of uh, Proud Shoes. I had um, the book that Thurgood Marshall used on race and color in America. I got a copy of that from a library and um, just as many books as I could find that would tell me about who Pauli Murray was. And so um, a combination of all that and articles online. So, you know, it's a rabbit hole when you start to do research and one thing leads to another thing leads to another thing. And then people know that I'm working on this. And so they send me articles. And um, so it's like a puzzle to put together. Yeah, and I, um, you mentioned in, in your book, um, there's, you know, some direct reference to that notion of, you know, you have a woman or person here who was a poet, you know, who started out wanting to be a poet and then, um, but then becomes an activist and then a lawyer. 
and in those legal writings, like you talk about, you know, the, that book that Thurgood Marshall thought was so important that mm -hmm. she wrote for the Methodist church that was, you know, 760 some yes. pages long, yes. um, but was meant to be a pamphlet, which I think is reflective <laughs> of the diligence to which um, they took their tasks when they were um, given something to do, you know, asked to write a pamphlet, they wrote a 767 page Bible on segregation laws across the United States. Across the United States. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There, there, were, there were lots of things that, that showed how driven Polly was and just um, had an understanding of this is what I have to know about this, and this is what I can share. So Polly did lots of research and was on top of things, but throughout their life, just so driven and passionate. I read a little blurb that said um, she only slept out of necessity. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, when when you look at the totality of that life, there there was not a lot of time for no. <laughs> um, the uh, you know I as I mentioned you know but you've got poetry and legal writing and so it's spanning you know her her writing spans all these different forms, um, all of which were powerful and had impact. I'm I'm curious which of those writings was most important to you um, that when you were writing the book and 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 that really hit you the hardest. I loved her autobiography. Mm -hmm. I just love the autobiography. The big, giant, thick book um, that you just kind of have to wade through, but it just gave so much information about every little thing about their life. And there's, there. I mean, you could just get a real feel for who this person was and what was important to them. And they were a no-nonsense person. They were a totally a no-nonsense person. You know, um, so, so that, the, that particular book um, was, was my favorite. Um, so that's the Song in a Weary Throat. Right. And um, one of the other things, I, I was talking about the rabbit hole that you go down and you start to figure out how people are connected in history. And it's like, oh, so it was important to have a timeline and kind of look at things. And was like, oh, this was and this happened and this was and this happened. And so I, I was reading and I discovered that she was at St. Mark's. She attended St. Mark's in New York City. And I was like, I knew somebody that was at St. Mark's. And it turns out that the, the priest that was there at St. Mark's um, when Polly Murray was attending there for part of the time she was attending there at least, um, was the same priest that married me in St. Louis. <laughs> wow. So I was like, wow. So I'm good friends with, with, um, with Michael Allen's daughter. And so I called her and I was like, do you remember this woman? And I said, she lived across the street from the church. Yeah. And she was like, she looks familiar, but I don't know. <laughs> So um, she connected me with the church secretary mm -hmm. who remembered her. And so I was able to have a conversation with her, um, Nell Gibson. And I said, tell me about Polly Murray. What do you know about her? So it, it was like I was, the more I got into the rabbit hole, the closer I got and could almost touch her, <laughs> you know, and so... Mm -hmm that part of it was really interesting. And, the, and then the other part that was really personal was that um, my mother had attended seminary in New York as well, but mm -hmm. it was, um, so my mom was in the forties. So as best I can figure their paths must have crossed at some point because my mom was active in the Episcopal church. So then it got to be like a real personal study of, of Polly Murray's life. It's like, okay, where could she have been that my mom was? Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. That's so amazing as far as a journey in, in the writing process to find mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, you know, as a civil rights icon, Polly Murray's work is often maybe overshadowed by, you know, the voices that we've been told to listen to or heard from. Why did they not get more attention? Um, was writing your book intended to remedy some of that? Partially intended to remedy that. 
and I'll answer this in two ways. <clears throat> One of the reasons that that Pauli Murray has not gotten the attention that other icons have is because of something that she wrote about that she called Jane Crow. And Jane Crow was based on gender rather than race. So you were discriminated against because of your gender. And that is a common practice that is still in place, um, that women don't have that. Um, it's one of the reasons that Polly Murray fell out with the, the people of now, and she was one of the founders of the National Organization of Women, but they, they weren't paying enough attention to the needs and rights of um, African American women. So um, there, there was this Jim Crow thing in place, and it was like, nah. the other part of that is what I found is when we when we talk about African American history, we're assigned who our heroes are. Mm -hmm. It's like, here is who you should be proud of. Here is who you should know about. And we can all say those names together. Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, Harriet Tubman, I mean, Frederick Douglass, they're all the same names. And so the way the curriculum is set up, is this is what you get to learn. Here are your heroes, these five people, and that's all you get. Yeah. And so because, the, because of that assigning of, of heroes and icons, those people don't appear in the history books. They've done tremendous work. And one of the things that I tried to do when I taught young children um, African-American history, I always dug for the people that I had never heard of or that they never would have heard of and introduced that new person. Mm -hmm. Because I said, you're not learning if I teach you about Martin Luther King every year. You're just, you're not learning about him. <laughs> you know him already. Yep. And everybody starts that education in kindergarten. So, um, so we have to start to, to have that equal that equal balance of who our icons and heroes are um, based on their good works and nothing else. <laughs> yeah. And so the, um, the other part is that um, I like the idea of writing a book that was for children. We miss a tremendous amount of time with children by not giving them um, history books at a very young age. I taught kindergarten. And that's where I taught my black history lessons was in kindergarten. And so the kids have a strong sense of uh, fairness of right and wrong. And so you can present stories and have really wonderful deep conversations with, with these really young learners and they're able to take that in. So for me to be able to write a book that adds to that is really exciting. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, for people who might not be familiar, you know, the, the work that that they did early on in their legal career had a huge impact on Brown v. Board of Education. Um, mm -hmm. you, know, their, uh, you know, they wrote letters, you know, if she was on a bus and arrested for not getting and, and moving like Rosa Parks was, but 15 years before or 18 years before Rosa Parks, mm -hmm. you know, um, so it's, it's really amazing the amount of of, of work that they did, the amount of work or uh, the amount of impact that they had and that the writing had. Um, so yeah, it is, as you said, the curriculum is limited to the number of people and, and people don't want to see the breadth of, of impact. No, no. The, you know, the, the best way to um, exclude us from history is just by not telling the stories. Yeah. Just, you know, never mention it and then they didn't exist. And so that's, that's so not true. So, I mean, I encourage parents and teachers to, to still share those, those stories and, and they're not hurtful stories, but they add to the, to the whole story of, of, of America. Um, so I, I think that's, that's important as well. The, um, we talked a little bit about, you know, already this notion of the potential of this book being something that would be banned doesn't you know, fit into the curriculums that exist right now. Um, and uh, you know, there, these concerted efforts to, you know, um, to stop certain things from being published or taught. How, how does your book specifically approach the themes that are difficult like racism and LGBTQ issues? 
for ages six to 12. Why is it important for children to learn about these topics? So um, with a book like this, the, the children at different levels will take something away from this book. For very, very young learners, they'll learn Polly Murray's name. Polly Murray was a civil rights person. And so that's, that's just enough. That's just enough of a hook for later on when her, when her name comes up again, it's like, I know that name. And so they have something to hook that new information on and then build on that as they learn more and more in high school and college and everything like that. So, so, so that's, that's one thing. Um, the other thing was how, how do you deal with these things? In fact, it's in fact, this was the, this was the law. This is how this was taught you know, provide a timeline. This is what was happening in history. And here is where these pivotal things happen for her. So, so in that way. And also I was very conscious of balance in the book. And I, I, I kept speaking with my editors about balance because I feel really strongly that any one person has multi-layers to who they are. And it's important to have this balance of, I'm not all one thing or all of another thing, but just, so I tried to normalize a lot of what I was saying about them, about their relationship. She and Irene loved and cared for each other. Yep. Period. No explanation, nothing about, choices or anything else, that's a statement. And you can either take that as, oh, they love and cared for each other, like friends do. If you're older, like boyfriend and girlfriend do. As you're older, like lovers do. <laughs> so, so you take away from that whatever your background experience is, and sometimes you have questions about that. And that's when the adults come in and you say, Oh, you have a question about this. So actually I had kids to read the book, a couple of kids to read the book as I was writing it. Okay. And it was really interesting what their questions were. So it was like, cause I wanted that balance. I didn't want anything to be too heavy in the book. I don't want to talk too much about gender. I don't want to talk too much about civil rights. I don't, I want it all balanced. <laughs> and so, um, the, the, one, the one set of kids said, oh, she got arrested, but she was a good person. How come she got arrested? <laughs> they were really interested in the, the whole jail thing. They were really into that. And how long did she stay in jail? And was it hard? And I mean, so that, that was a big thing for them. Another person that read the book um, said, was Polly queer? And the mom had this conversation with her, with her child about this. And so it was like, yes, yes, I'm writing that book that has enough layers that kids on different levels will take away what they need without anything being too heavy handed or naming it when, when I don't have the right to name something. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I was careful not to name things about her life that were speculation on my part. I wanted to base it all on things that I had read and that I knew for a fact. So there are things about her gender and her um, gender questioning that, that she went through. I didn't feel like that was a necessary or important conversation for kids at this age, but that they would have this, this conversation later so I, I continued to talk about this being a book that was introductory. This is like, this is my friend Polly. And Polly did all of these wonderful things. And she was born in 1910. Can you imagine that? She had a job when she was eight. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine her walking a mile across town to earn a quarter and then walking back? And she walked by herself when she was a young kid. Those are amazing things to do. Those are important things. And, and the important part about she was weird. She felt different than other people. And what kid doesn't feel weird? And isn't it cool to read a book about somebody else who feels weird? And it was weird for 
you know, not what you think, you know, was she feeling weird about gender? Yes. But she also felt weird because other people had parents and she didn't. Her parents had died when she was very young. So that made her different. Another thing that made her feel different is she was left-handed. <laughs> so, so that, I mean, you know, so kids pick out those things for any number of reasons why they feel weird. But to read about somebody else who's going through weirdness and still becomes an amazing person and still can contribute to the world is so important uh, um, for kids to hear and to, to know about. You know, I love that um, I found out that she talked in school and she talked to all her friends. And I suspect because she was super smart, mm -hmm. she finished her work and then she was ready to, you know, have social time. <laughs> and so her grades were like always low in behavior in school in the, in the younger grades. But um, how cool is that? Did you hear about somebody who got in trouble <laughs> and they still became an important person? You never see that in a book about Martin Luther King. <laughs> yeah. They're very interesting in that regard. And, and as you said, you know, all kinds of things like, you know, walking across town, because even as a young child, refusing to get on a segregated bus, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. you know, just standing up for rights at that young of an age. Um, yes. And, uh, and then getting in trouble and being different um, was the cornerstone, I think, of Pauli Murray's life and, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and yet fighting for everybody's rights, no matter what their differences are. No matter what, no matter what. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, you talked a little bit about your favorite parts of, of her writing, um, you, know, uh, you know, with the song in a weary throat. Um, for those who don't know Polly's work or are just learning about her tonight, you know, what would you recommend as a way into reading about her? So you, you can start your rabbit hole journey the same way I started my rabbit hole journey. Go to Wikipedia. There's a Wikipedia article. But the interesting thing that once you get those little facts at the beginning of a Wikipedia article, you go down to the bottom and there's sources for where they got those from. And they got them from her books and her works and her articles that she's written and all those things. So those are, those are places that you can go from there. So there's a starting place at least. And we're lucky because there's so much information online now. So you can get all of those things online. Mm -hmm. All of her books are still available. Song in a Weary Throat is available. Um, uh, Dark Testament, which is her poetry is still available. Um, what is the other one? Proud Shoes is available. All of those are still available for reading. Some of them are on Audible if you, if you can't go the route of, of reading really thick, dense things. Um, fascinating are the things on YouTube. There, there are things where you get to see her and using her words. And those are exciting, exciting to see because it makes it a real person. It's a real person that these things really happen to. And that's always important to me when I'm telling stories to children that, you know, there's so many fictitious characters in movies and kinds of things like this, but this was a real person that actually went through all this. So all of those places are, are, are excellent places. The only thing that I couldn't get my hands on was her book of sermons. And um, the copy that I found was $1,000. So I couldn't take that deep dive yet, but. <laughs> I, if I'm not mistaken, I think there is a book coming out of her sermons um, edited by a professor that we have been in contact with and I have suddenly forgotten his name. It, one of my staff has been in touch. Um, so I think nice. there's to be a, not all of her sermons, but like a collection of some of her uh, strongest sermons. Um, Would love to see those. I, I will try and find uh, the information on that for you. Okay. Um, I, I would love to see it myself as well. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's one of those amazing things that you have someone who's written family history, autobiography, poetry, legal mm -hmm. writing. Um, and, and, and even, you know, we talk about, you know, just the notion of letter writing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she wrote letters to Franklin Delano Roosevelt that got the attention of Eleanor Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She did, um, a friend of hers had suggested to her when you're upset about something, just write to the people and let them know. 
And so she, she wrote to, she would write a letter to anybody. And then I later found out that she wrote letters on holidays, on patriotic holidays is, was her big time to write letters. Yeah. And so that's when she'd take out pen and paper and her handy trusty typewriter and she would zip off a letter and she did not bite her tongue. She could say what she needed to say. And there, um, I can't remember, I saw the article, so so forgive me for, for not doing this correctly, but she wrote a, a letter to Richard Nixon about the fact that there were no women on the Supreme Court <laughs> and that she would gladly put herself forward for that, for that position. And, um, you know, yet again, she was just out there ahead of, of life before these things actually came to pass. And, um, trailblazer you know that 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 was her yep they um i i'm curious um about your own background as a writer you know um who do you read and admire you know how do you choose to write as a way of making change yourself so i started writing when i was a kid and uh i wrote uh radio script. They used to have stories and plays on the radio at a school or a public school. And I won a couple of contests by writing and I was like, oh, this is fun. So I kind of stuck with it and journaled and wrote some poetry and wrote some other things here and there. And um, most recently, I, I, I self-published a book um, about 9-11 um, and it was The Day the World Changed. And I was so distraught and I was trying to process, but I was also trying to help parents and teachers process this with kids. What do you tell kids about this? Because the parents were so upset and we were all so upset and everybody's crying at the television screen and you know, you just can't go on and we didn't know what was gonna happen. And so I was like, we need a way to tell this to kids to make them know that we'll keep you as safe as we can. And, and that the world has changed, but we're gonna go on. And so I sat down and I kind of wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote this whole book. And I had my kids, my own two children who were nine and 11 at the time, and they illustrated the book. And then we took it and had some work done on it and it got self-published. And I, I, um, I sent the money to organizations that would help kids um, affected by 9-11. So, that was a piece of change in my hand. I mean, you know, that was, that was able to change some kids' lives and parents thanked me for that. And the kids thanked me for that. And I gave out books and I sold books and, and did that whole thing. And it was so funny. My nephew um, was away at college and uh, a friend of his, he went in his room and on the bookshelf was a copy of The Day the World Changes. And he's like, why do you have that book? My aunt wrote that. <laughs> So here this book was precious to this kid that he took at the college with him. And uh, it was like, okay, one little small act that I did to write this little book was able to change people's hearts and minds and things. And so, you know, that, that was really cool. Um, I, my favorite author is Maya Angelou. I've read all of her books. I love how she paints with words. Always love that. Got a chance to meet her on a couple of occasions and was just in awe of her since I did my book report in high school, I guess, on I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings like everybody else. But it was, uh, it, it was, it was one of those things was like, oh my gosh, if I could just paint with words like that, that would be so amazing. Um, the other thing about what I read is I'm not a recreational reader, but I read for research. So I love the deep dive. So if you put me at task, I mean, when I was working on this museum project that I had um, and trying to help kids learn about as many different African-Americans as they could, I would just dig into book after book about a variety of African-Americans and what they could do and, and their contributions and things. And so I love research. And I love writing from research, you know, that, that I've done. Wow. That's, that's great. The, um, I'm curious, um, and I'm going to remind the audience, if you have questions, um, 
uh, please pop them into the Q&A box. Um, I'm going to ask another question before we take any from the audience. Um, but I am curious how you think people can, who are watching tonight, can think about continuing the legacy of Pauli Murray's activism, regardless of their age. So one of the things that was really important to Pauli was she talks about how the, um, how the baton was passed to her. And it was really important who passed the baton to her. What were the people that came ahead of her and what had they given her? And then she realized the importance of her life and, and, and the changes that she could make and who she would then pass the baton to. So it was from and to, and she was in that space in the middle. And she realized that she had a role in that. And so she decided to do something about that. She took that seriously with teaching and with learning and with everything was a next step to something else. She realized her, her place in history as well. So on this long line of history, she's like, I've got this much time and this is how I need to affect the world while I'm here. So that started when she was a young kid all the way to the time that, that she died at, you know, at age 77, I believe. And, and so, you know, my thing for people to carry on that, find that thing that you're passionate about. And it has to be, it, it can be a tiny little thing. It can be a tiny little thing. I wrote that book. I didn't become famous with that book. That was another thing that I read about Polly that I admired. She wasn't doing it for the fame and glory. She didn't do it because she was a first. You know, that the, the rank that in which she did things didn't matter to her. It was that she did the work. She did that hard work. So you start with something small that you're passionate about. I don't like this. I'm going to write a letter about this. You know, I, I don't like this kind of thing. So I'm going to say something. I don't like how somebody is treating somebody else. So I'm going to be a friend of theirs. So there's, there are things that we can do. And then you, I mean, you know, you start to live into all of that. And that's what she did. She lived into all of those things that she learned and all of, all of the, the knowledge that she gained. She lived into that. You know, she used the law. To, to, to better the world. She used being a priest as a way to, to, to better people's lives and to, to continue to care for the sick after she was no longer a priest, you know, or longer an active priest, I'll say. So, she, you know, she used her whole life up. <laughs> There's supposed to be nothing left at the end. <laughs> You've used it all up. And we need to figure out how to do that. What does that look like? You know, I used to, I've, I used to feel bad for kids that nobody would play with or somebody, you know, would not talk to them because they didn't look like everybody else. Now I make friends with that. So I had lots of misfit friends. Those were my favorite friends. <laughs> they were, were the people who were misfits. Those are things that we can do. That, you know, change your heart about somebody. That's another thing we can do. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I don't understand this whole thing about this, but let me find out about this. So be curious about things and work on those small changes that end up being big changes when, when other people join in because they, they see your joy. Yeah. Well, I have a question from the audience about if you have plans to write another book and you know what you are going to write next. <laughs> At this point, I don't have plans to write another book. This was quite the adventure um, and quite the learning experience. And I'm not opposed to writing another book, but um, I would probably write about um, another person in African-American history and um, someone that children don't know well. I like the idea of introducing characters at a young age to children. And so I would, um, that would be my challenge is to figure out who that next person was that we really need to know more about. Uh, and, you know, you mentioned, you know, this was quite a process in writing this book. This is also an illustrated book. Mm -hmm. um, what was that process like for you in this? You know, I know you mentioned that when you, wrote your original book on 9-11, you had your kids do the illustrations and then you had things, you know, 
put together. I'm kind of curious what you, um, what this process was like, the artists that you're working with and that kind of thing. So um, n not a lot of, um, not a lot of work with the illustrator, but we, we had um, a couple of good conversations about things that I wanted to see in the book and things that I thought were important. They're black and white illustrations, so they kind of have to have some power behind them. They, you know, they have to kind of kind of get at whatever the, the area that I'm talking about. So um, one of the things was she had probably heard this great smile. So I wanted, I wanted to show her great smile um, in the book. Another thing was that I, as I was doing research and looking at pictures of her, is she often wore um, a seahorse pin on her, <laughs> on her clothes. So when I would write, I would try to channel Polly and I'd put all my seahorse pins that I collected. Um, but so that's something for the kids to look for in the book is like, where's the seahorse pin? And it's not really clear, but it was just kind of that little wink to, this was something that you know was special to her. And um, so we talked about what's important to show the children to, to help bring the story to life. And so those were some good conversations. And so the artist looked at some pictures, um, a variety of pictures and kind of um, gave her artistic spin on, on those. And I think they came out really nicely. I'm very happy with them. That's very cool. Um... The, uh, I, I, I guess, you know, I, um, if anybody has a question, please feel free to put it into the Q&A box. Um, I was curious um, in this notion of, you know, Pauli Murray as somebody who's maybe been forgotten and now is seeing a resurgence. You mentioned writing about other people who have been forgotten, um, you know, it, the, pro the, the process of writing allows us to bring these things back to the fore for folks. Um, and, uh, and, and yet, you know, and, and it's wonderful because like you said, her books are still available and, and things that people can read. Um, but sometimes you find people where that isn't the case, where their stuff has gone out of print and, and where it's really hard to find that. Is there anybody in, in the work that you've done in the past that kind of stands out where you're like, you know the work that they did, but it's really hard to, to find the voice in who they were? Mm, that's a hard one. Um, I know one person that, that we're hearing more about in the Episcopal Church is Barbara Harris. Mm -hmm. And, um, but once again, the, the Barbara Harris books that I know are adult books. And I know there's, there's been more and more written on her of late. Um, she will be kind of a fun person to tackle, um, to kind of tell her stories to her story to kids and what, what her life looked like and, and led her to become the, the first, um, African-American, uh, woman bishop in the Episcopal church. Um, so I don't know, they're, they're just, you know, there, there's so many different people. One of the things that I, uh, I would teach kids about was all the people in the background, all the people that would support this person. So when I would, you know, when I would do my lesson on uh, Martin Luther King, I would always say, but he didn't do it by himself. That, I always added that he didn't do that by himself. <laughs> there were other people that were there. And so as I would find names of people, I could at least give them names of people so that those, those people's names were spoken if I didn't have a lot of information on them. Um, but there were these women that, that worked in offices and made sandwiches and made flyers and pamphlets and organized things. And, um, you know, there are all those people and that's how we can all be a part of this forward movement of, of justice for all. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll keep looking for the important person that we don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, and, um, you know, as you mentioned, Barbara Harris and, and you know, um, obviously for Polly Murray, faith was a, a hugely important part of their life. Um, even if, you know, their status as LGBTQ at the time would have made it very difficult. Um, and, uh, and yet, 
overarching through their entire life. They were devoted to their church. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so how do you see, you know, in, in, in your book and, and in their life, you know, this issue of faith being so important? How do you deal with it in the book? Um, Polly was raised um, to have, you know, with this faith tradition, that that was an important thing in their, in their home. Um, her aunt that raised her, um, they had, you know, I, I mentioned that there was a, a, a place of honor for the cross in their, in their house. And it, it was in their, their living room. And that was a place where she could go and be quiet. She read the Bible to her um, grandfather and grandmother. Um, so that was a part of who she was. That was, that was the way that she was raised. She went and, and um, stayed with her other aunt Sally and at, who had married a priest. And so there was more work there. And I think when you're raised like that, and I, I will say this from my own experience, when you're raised that way, it just becomes your filter for how you see the world. And it, it helps it helps you to make sense of the world, or at least religion does that for me. So I kind of got this sense that that was the same for, for Polly. And so um, Polly carried around this, this sense of, this is what this means. It, she put it in that, that, that filter of, of her faith traditions and her faith. Uh, and, and she got to a place where she was questioning the church. And she walked out of the church at one point and she, she there, her time um, spent in the Episcopal church was not without um, questions or, or whatever. And she got so angry that there were no women participating in things. It could be an altar guild or you could, you know, be in the choir, you could teach Sunday school, but that, that's good enough for you all. And, you know, Sunday after Sunday, she's, she's looking up on the altar and it's all men, all men, all men. It's like, no, no. And so that was yet something else that she needed to, to make a change with. And um, so the best way to make the change is to become a part of that. <laughs> and it's like, I'm a person of great faith. I'm a person who has religion and, and I can affect this change through, you know, going through the process. And um that was the way they 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 saw they saw things was through through the lens of of a faith um, and having a faith community that, that supported that. And um, I'm kind of curious what your thoughts are when someone like Polly is raised heavily with that um, with that religion and but also there's there's something to the notion that her writing may have been influenced by such close reading. Um, you know, I think of Frederick Douglass, you know, he only had two books um, that he could read from. One was a book of classic oration and the other was a King James Bible. Um, and so that really influenced Douglass as a writer. How do you think the faith influenced um, her as a writer? I think it always affected everything that, you know, how she, how she saw um, family, how she saw connections with people, um, that was, that was what brought her together with um, her longtime partner, Irene, was they discovered that they were both Episcopalians. And so they would spend their lunch hours going to, to church, to the afternoon church service. And, and I, I think that when you are raised like that, when you know the Bible, when you know you know, you have this strong sense of faith and, and this, this other remarkable thing that happened to her um, is Bishop Delaney, who was one of the first bishops in the Episcopal, uh, African-American bishops in the Episcopal church, lays hands on her and says, you're a child of destiny. You don't have a choice but to live into that. That just becomes who you are and whether it's in the back of your head at any given time, it's still there as part of you. So it becomes um, part of how you express yourself, part of how you live in the world and live into all these different uh, life-changing situations. Um, but it was just faith 
guides how you walk through the world. Yep. Well, I think um, that we're, we're, we're kind of running out of time and I think that may be a good place for us to stop. Um, I have really enjoyed our conversation. I hope our audience has enjoyed learning more about Polly Murray and about your book and your process of putting this together. And I think, you know, what you talked about as far as doing little things, as much as writing a small book or something that might be picked up, writing a letter, that there's a lot of ways that people can learn from Polly Murray um, and, and, and do good. So, yes. yes. And I hope that this book is one of those things that makes kids think about it. So I hope so. I hope so. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks so much for being with us and, and thanks for doing this work.